Andrew and uh, Stephen and uh, previous years, uh, well, uh, still to some extent, uh, Jeff News, uh, his job of keeping away from meetings, but he's been doing stuff on the servers. Um, Mike, for years, did stuff. Joe B in the back row there, he used to do all kinds of stuff on the servers. Uh, so uh, you don't have to have a big formal meeting. Sometimes you can just work from home or work from your office and do little things at the big home. So. Uh, so I'm going to just want to volunteer to kick in. I nominate Lee for the board of governors. <laughs> what do you not? We haven't opened the meeting, have we? Did anybody call the meeting to order? No, no. You can nominate anybody anytime. I'm on the nomination committee, so it's Gary. You're lucky I didn't put your name on the ballot. I wrote. I wrote Stanford's name. Write it down. Write it down. But put it down for secretary. Hmm. Put it down for secretary. Okay. The last piece of. Uh, seemingly mindless trivia. Uh, <laughs> lawyers drew up our articles of incorporation. Uh, one of the things with uh, well, one one stop C corporations, uh, you know, he's got it. Uh, they, they're, they put in a requirement for an annual meeting of the membership, uh, which since we meet like seven times a month, seems totally ridiculous and useless, but it is the official time when somebody can raise their meat book and say something. Uh, now, since we pretty well have an open forum, anybody can say anything anytime. I wonder why we do that. But just to satisfy the legal requirements and bylaws, that's what we're going to do. Um, so, uh, I we, never remember the, 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 the exact format we're supposed to use for the meeting. That's why I keep inviting Rich to come because he kind of remembers better than I do. That's been 10 years ago. I don't even know. We've had a running fun. joke for years where, where we, we time the annual meeting because since there's nothing to do, um, we can do it very quickly. So uh, so it's always trying to repeat the previous year's time. Um, so just to accommodate that, if anybody has anything they want to include in the minutes of the official meeting, before we start the official meeting, would you care to say anything you want to do? Shh. I move we adjourn. I can't adjourn. It hasn't been hold that for the official meeting. It wouldn't come to you. <laughs> and I suggest, Rich, why don't you run the official meeting? I don't remember oh, it. It's so simple. I, I, I run the I'll run the official stopwatch. <laughs> okay, we won't get the official stopwatch generator. Okay. Uh, all right. Sure Typically, it's the president that calls the meeting to our Yeah, but you can do it. I move we adjourn. <laughs> okay, we're not going to spend time arguing about it. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> here we go. Ready with the stop one. Okay, the meeting is called to order. We'll I move we adjourn. Second? Second. All in favor, say five years, aye. 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 Three opponents, no? Carries? Adjourn. 7.6. There we go. That's two seconds floor. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. I need a lot of practice. <laughs> How about another meeting? <laughs> no, I'm going to skip the other meeting. Uh, let's see. Quick announcements are maybe not so quick, uh, but we'll get through them as quick as we can. Um, coming up, uh, our next meeting on our list is the senior group. Snug. Senior group. Oh, the, the senior? Uh, yeah. Your cap. Yeah, it doesn't have a fixed presentation. You're all welcome to come. Uh, the snug meeting is uh, lunch next Wednesday, and Lee, do you remember the topic? I think it's the same one from last month that we couldn't do. Uh, security, infrastructure, security. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it was infrastructure, security. So. Uh, there's the St. Louis log on next Thursday night. Uh, Andrew, do you remember the topic? Lee is doing a talk on, and let's encrypt this. Let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. Uh, let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. Let's encrypt. And I think the website in question was the stlwinux.org. Maybe. Yeah. Otherwise, I'll show the one I did. Okay, then we got the Hazelwood, and then we got the, <coughs> the Steercom, and then we got Slack, and it just keeps repeating. Saturday it came, the release came out. Uh, Maru OS is a Debian desktop that you run off your uh, uh, Android phone. 
So basically, you run this on the phone. As long as you plug the phone into a uh, monitor and put a keyboard and a mouse on it, you're basically taking away the touch screen off the phone. And instead of running in a pure Android, it, it actually runs the Debian operating system. And so it kind of gives you a, a, a <coughs> use of your CPU right there on the uh, on the uh, on the, uh, the, contra, the when was that talked about? What meeting was that? That wasn't a meeting. It was a. Uh, it was a that was a, just in the events. The event, oh, that was released. That was a, yeah, it was released yeah. on Saturday, February the sixth. So when are we going to have a talk on how to do that? Uh, actually, soon somebody decides to play with it. Do talk on. I think they need idea. Uh, there's a, a, a I'm intrigued because there's a uh, an opposite side of the coin uh, going back to January fourteenth. That's what your Windows Phone. Uh, nope. This is Remix uh, OS, and uh, you know, what it does is it runs the Android, or it lets you run your Android <coughs> apps on an Android that runs on your desktop machine. Uh, so you know, it's kind of the opposite. In this case, you're, uh, it's a nice way of you know, those apps that you, know, you wish you had just running on your desktop. You can run them right there on your, uh, on your desktop or your laptop. So, I tried to do that this week, this month. Um, Tremendous amount of bloat. Oh yeah, just to get an Android SDK on your PC. Oh yeah. Okay. What were you doing with it? Yeah. Remix? No. No. Well, the SDK has the all SDK. the libraries. Yeah. The tremendous amount of bloat. Like in the 1.5 gigabyte range. Wow. Okay. Anybody else trying something? Like um. That? Do you think that we can uh, move on to Adam's talk because we're shortening his amount of time he can talk? Yes. Let's move on. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> any other necessary announcements? Uh, I have to go out to my truck and get the sign in sheet on the truck. Okay. This can be bad. Or we can just write everyone that showed up on the back of a sheet and that'll be good. That's true. When do your two weeks of attendance have to be completed to vote by? Calendar year. Last this calendar year or last calendar? Last, previous calendar year. So you got 2015. You have to, you you have to attend it twice in 2015. Right. Yeah. You did. You did. You sure? Yes. Yeah, I'm certain of it. <laughs> Trust me, I remember. <laughs> Derek, yes. since Adam once, once, once a lot of time, I, I will uh, put, put up a motion that will cruise into his talk. Okay, well, let's go. Uh, one last thing, and that is on the February the 3rd, uh, Go happened to be added to the Foronix benchmarks, so you can actually uh, benchmark uh, your Go program on Foronix. So with that, uh, actually, Andrew, would you like to introduce it? Hey, everybody. Uh, Adam Thornton here is going to give a fantastic talk about the Go language. And he has put a lot of energy and got a, a lot of feedback from individuals. And he will laugh quite a lot. So get ready for the giggles. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> so as you can see, the title of tonight's talk is Go. It mostly doesn't suck. And I feel it very necessary at this point to point out that I'm speaking as Adam Thornton. Some dude with a Gmail address, and in and 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 in no way speaking for any of my employers, past, present, or future. So, let's get things out of the way first. The big important one is that all software sucks. This is not even debatable. Um, my job for the next forty-five minutes, which goes sucks less than most of the other software you have to encounter in your life. Um, it is also true that all hardware sucks and all users suck, and both of those are outside the scope of tonight's discussion. So, the much shortened version of my presentation is merely this slightly hacked XKCD uh, cartoon. Um, you should learn Go. What is it? Not C. What's it like? C. What the hell? <laughs> That's all I really want. <laughs> okay, you can go. That, that was the important part. Okay. <laughs> Everyone's free to take off now. Okay, so what does that mean? It's like C, but it's not C. So I tried for an analogy here. 
oh, this may not have gone quite the way I thought it was going to go. So let's say the Go feels like programming. Right? Let's make that the normative programming experience. So the C is kind of like programming Go with your uh, nether bits flapping in the wind. Python feels like programming, only you've got training wheels on, so you can't fall off and hurt yourself too easily. Perl, well, it doesn't have training wheels, and it doesn't go, and it's more like unicycling naked. This, of course, feels, as it has done for the last 30 years, like wielding an elegant weapon for more civilized age. Java makes me feel at least like I'm wearing mittens while trying to program. Cobol, <laughs> this is a little worse than the mittens. It's handcuffs and drunk in the back of a police cruiser. Not that that's, you know, something I, I would know about. And HP, <laughs> of course, feels exactly like punching yourself in the balls as hard as you can over and over and over. And over. Andy? Gender, for the uh, gender neutral, do you have an analogy for the female gender? Um, I lack the relevant experience, and I'm not about to ask him. Okay. <laughs> what about Ruby? Uh, Ruby is. Uh, he was trying to use popular programming languages. Oh, popular. Okay. What's Ruby like? Um, Ruby's like trying to uh, ride a. Bicycle that someone keeps changing out the wheels on while you're trying to ride it down the road in a brisk wind, yeah, or the or the two old-fashioned ones, Fortran and Basic. Well, uh, Basics like uh, giving directions to a 95-year-old person, and uh, you said Fortran. Mm -hmm. Fortran. <laughs> like programming for the Dark Ages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Need uh, something a little bit more out. Does anybody does anybody remember Fortran? Well, I remember mm -hmm. Fortran. <laughs> um, okay. It, it feels like a much less elegant weapon, a less civilized. <laughs> <laughs> but my favorite quote when I learned C and Unix was they said that the T that IBM's TSO time sharing option. Was, this was the intro back in 1979. C and Unix were so elegant because TSO was like kicking a dead whale along a beach. Yes. Ooh. I tend to concur. So slightly less pungent. Right? Ways that go is actually like C. It's a small language. It's only got 25 keywords. I did some other major languages there. I tried to find out how many keywords there are in Perl. <laughs> And it was really difficult because it wasn't clear whether like the punctuation variables count as keywords or not. And could you just pipe a word list into the interpreter or not? I, I, when I tried that, I got about 140, but I'm not sure that that was plus or minus a bunch depending on what. So <laughs> Go is a statically typed language, so none, none of this fancy dynamic programming stuff. Um, which has its inconveniences from what you want to do is hammer out of the iPad, <coughs> but is also kind of nice when you want something that isn't going to explode in exciting ways when you do it. Um, it's a Thompson type production in large part, which, so what you like, this guy's have good taste and a good track record, is basically a procedural language with that little layer. And the hipsters hate it. The hipsters, honestly, I think mostly hate it because it's a lot like C, but, um, you know, it is true that. It's not quite as a purple water as as Haskell, and why aren't you using Scala? All the cool things. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of C. So why shouldn't you just use C? A fair question. Some of the things that I like a lot better um, in Go and in C, you don't really have to do your own memory management. Yes, there are still pointers, but like malloc and free are things of the past. So it's garbage collected, which, yes, means you shouldn't use it for hard real-time tasks. Um, type safety is a lot better because not, every, not everything is just a pointer. Um, if you have a pointer to a specific data type, it is a pointer to that type. You have to explicitly go through the unsafe library if you want to do um, crazy pointer conversions. And the uh, static analyzer power is really quite good. And so you, you end up with a lot fewer things that slip by the compiler and then uh, explode at runtime. The set of standard libraries that come with the language is enormous compared to C. Um, I mean, it, it's really a lot more like Python in terms of its breadth. Um, don't know if that's necessarily a 
problem with our page because I really want to go to where you can get C libraries, but yeah. it's nice to have. Um, the import dependency management is so much better than C, so we'll get to that. Yes, the wage operator is just syntactic trivial, but it does mean that you don't really have to track the loop variables and constantly reference what they with the index. It's a very I find it a very pleasant convenience to have. Um, we'll talk a little about interfaces, but it's basically Go's way of doing polymorphism among different types. Oh, a couple other things before I continue. Um, I'm going to be saying casually things like polymorphism among different types. I sort of made the assumption that if you're listening to this talk, you are already a programmer, and if that's not true, I apologize, but feel free to interrupt at any time and say, hey, Adam, give me a little context here. Um, because I, I realize that not all of you may be coming out of development or at least recent development backgrounds. So feel free to say, slow down, back up, unpack that, and I'll be happy to. Um, so you mentioned it has polymorphism, so is it inherently object oriented? There, there is an object model that is a part of it, which I have a few slides on. Um, but it is more procedural than is yeah, it's more procedural than is object. It's more inherent. Um, the and the object problem I think is very seamly designed. Um, and the, the polymorphism is interface based rather than inherent space. So you'll you'll see. Um, there's native concurrency support that is based on I think Tony Moore's CSP stuff from the late seventies. Um, and it's actually rather nice. It, Go is almost unique on the languages I've used in the the concurrence is clearly an inherent part of the language, but it doesn't dominate the language. So um, it doesn't feel all bolted on like, well, just look against the lib key thread library and then use join instead of using uh, the fork system call. It's like actually in the language and it, it also doesn't feel like you have to use it. You can, you can write perfectly same, perfectly idiomatic single thread programs, and it's fine. Um, there's native map type, which I find super handy. Um, if you use Python, it's dict. If you use Perl, it's hash. If you use Rex, it's a stem. But um, you know, it, it's part of the language, unlike C, where you have to bring in a map type from somebody's not there. And it's also, you know, the language designed in 2006, not 1975. And so Go isn't worried about passing large objects on the stack. Sure, you might have a multi megabyte uh, function stack frame. You don't care because memory is a whole lot cheaper now than it was in 75. You're, you can pass all the objects you want by value, not by reference, because again, yeah, memory is cheap. And there are no tricks that, well, the first six are going to be. Uh, on the stack, and those are going to registers, and the other ones are actually allocated to people. You don't care. Memory's memory, it's flat. It's cheap. Um, so that's kind of, kind of nice if you're used to see. Um, but I battled about the uh, various features of language now. Let's actually look at what it looks like. Here's Hello World Package name, import, quote, edit key, close quote, funk main. Open close friends, open curly bracket, and then key dot print run, hello world, close the brackets. So, what's that all mean? So, first line selects package. Package is the namespace. If you're you doing something that's going to be run on the command line, your namespace is main. We will look at others in a little while. Um, when you import and format, um, that gets its own uh, namespace. So this is roughly the equivalent of import standard IO.h, um, as you would feed it to a CP processor. Um, FMT is your text formatting package. Um, then you declare the main function. It takes no arguments. It returns nothing. So if you're wondering, since main in C is uh, in argc uh, pointer to an array of carrots argv, you get to that stuff through the os.rv, so you need to import os, and then your rv uh, list would have your command line rv values. Format print line, hello world. Um, you'll notice that the uh, name of the function is capitalized. We'll get to that a little bit later. 
And pipmon uh, doesn't take like the C formatting arguments, you know, like percent D and then you follow the command. Pipmon just prints the thing and throws new line up for you, which you know, is very Pascalish, but it's occasionally nice to have. Then you close the function with curly brackets, and since that's your main function, that's the end of the program. When control passes into there, main exits, and since you aren't doing anything like os.exit or well exit by default with return to zero. So, um, actually, this would probably be a really good time for me to bring up the code right now and look at this. And then back on. So, this is a Hello World program. This is a little live window at golang.org. You run it and it says hello. I guess that's probably Chinese in the world. Who knows? Maybe probably about 1.5 billion people in the world do know. I'm not one. So, Go packages. Um, Go, Go comes with a big set of uh, functions in the standard bar. Um, among the things you get, uh, complex numbers, arbitrary precision numbers, a whole bunch of stuff for HTTP on both the client and the server side to make requests and serve up uh, replies. You have a regular expression library that's maybe not as good as Perl's, but I think probably about as good as Python's. Um, JSON and XML parsers and uh, output formatters. So you can easily convert things both to and from JSON and XML, but interchangeable. Either other parts of our program or other programs. Uh, there's a you know, fairly straightforward 2D graphics library, all, all sorts of things. Um, one of the nifty things about Go is that it doesn't have separate cover points. So in C, right, you have to include something about H. And then you tell the compiler to link to whatever dot a or dot so in the modern world or dot the while if you have to be on OSX. But, right? But <coughs> the interface is specified in the header from the implementation of two separate things. It doesn't happen in Go. What Go does is that in its compiled um, library files, it puts all the function signatures at the head of that, which is nice because then when the compiler is doing this thing, it just opens that library and reads to the end of the prologue. And it knows what function prototypes are. So you can't end up with a split implementation and interface definition that don't agree with each other. Uh, the other nice thing is that imports are per file. And so you don't have to do all the event potency stuff you do and see, which, you know, after a while, sure, it becomes second nature, but it tripped me up when I was learning C and took a while to get used to it. You know, and see, you define a symbol. And then, if you haven't got it, if you haven't got a symbol to find, to find the symbol, and here's your code. Then every time you include it, it looks the symbol's already found, so it doesn't do it again. Um, that's not that much of an inconvenience to humans, and we probably shouldn't be worried about being inconvenient for computers. But one of the motivations of Go is that in a big C project, something like you know, several hundred thousand lines of code, so probably by the time you and link the whole thing, reading all of standard IO.h several hundred times. And that actually measurably does slow down compilation when you're depending on lots of external libraries. Um, the nice thing about Go is it does it you know, per file and then it keeps track of what it's already seen in an overall compilation. And so you basically end up scanning each library for its function signatures once, which in big projects means that compilation is a whole lot faster than it is with C or C++. The other thing that Go does that takes some getting used to, if you declare an import and you don't use anything from its import, that's not a compiler warning. That is a fatal compile time error. Your program will not build. And if you're me, you're probably going to spend about three weeks cursing. And then after the fourth week, you, especially if you go back to something else, you start wondering how you ever lived with that. Because at least all of my Python and C programs, after a while and after a certain size, end up with you know, a dozen imports, half of which I'm not actually using anymore. But I don't remember which half, and I'm not about to take the time to break the build trying to figure out what I can use to lay bare down. So it has kind of inherent static analysis and, and checks yeah. for things that don't. It doesn't need. Yes. And makes you fix it before. It yes, but before it will um, I mean, sure, you can just comment out that import line, but 
Yes, yeah, so if you if you import format, you don't use it. It won't fail. Which, um, once you get past your annoyance, is really kind of handy. So packages, linkers, loader, runtime environment, etc. Another thing that you're going to eat when you first start, and then after a little while, you'll just accept. You saw that uh, format print line started with capital P a um, few slides back. What that capital says is this function is exported. You can see it outside the package. That seems like an incredibly inky, Mickey Mouse way of doing it, right? What, a capital letter says I'm an exported someone? Yes, yes, it does. Um, after a while, you just get used to it. And it's kind of nice, because all the stuff you use of it only gets used inside that library, but isn't actually something you want the rest of the world to talk. You just begin it with a lowercase letter. You don't need a, you know, I'm going to prepend this with two underscores. And then people will hopefully know they shouldn't call it, and there's nothing really stopping them from doing so. Just it is enforced by the compiler. Just an elegant way of doing public and private. Yeah. And everything is statically linked to timing. So if you're using sort of pure Go, what you get <coughs> is an executable that contains all of its dependencies that you can transplant to any machine on the same architecture and run it and it will do the same thing. Well, same architecture and same OS because it is giving you a call whatever the kernel call is and display stuff on the screen. But, like if it's for Linux on AMD 64, you can pick it up and move it to any other Linux on AMD 64 box and it's going to run, which is pretty nice when you're developing in one place and trying to package the software for distribution on other places that certainly shouldn't have your development libraries, may or may not have, certainly should not have, may or may not have all the right libraries, um, and may or may not look anything like your development library. Um, yeah, certainly one of the problems with uh, C, right, is that you, you end up needing to run Autocomp and you need to make sure that you've got all the right dynamic libraries on the system so that you don't just start running and then fall over because you don't have the symbol for something you know from SSL. Um, Python, I've found, is generally even worse unless you're using uh, virtual image to make sure that you've got. Well, right yeah, libraries. eggs and wheels. Um, yeah. So eggs are a way of packaging up both your program and its dependencies. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, yeah, package managers can handle all this, but if you have, like, there it is, it's your binary itself. Um, that's only half true in that once you start using the uh, OS package, then you are, um, you will be using Seco to do that. You'll be linking the system calls if you're using OS. And therefore, you will now have a tendency on whichever lives here. Which can be annoying if you're developing on Ubuntu and trying to make something that's going to run on a super stripped down uh, environment, for instance, if you're doing containerized stuff. And you know, I, I've been doing a lot of Docker work, and that's been provocation here too. Um, on OSX, uh, you're linked against three system libraries. I don't remember what they are, but they're the libc equipment some security thing and uh, the display management stuff. But, but you don't have dependency on which is great. Um, the executables are big, but hey, it's, this is 2006 language, not 1975 language. So the executable for a fairly big project is 20 megs. The executable for even a little project is a couple of megs. So what? Just almost free copying it around the network is pretty close to free. Now, um, but this this isn't trying to uh, download the Doom log files over your 1200 bog modem in 1992. Um, something that is sort of interesting about that is that if you're using, say, the TLS implementation, someone finds a bug, you get to rebuild every single damn Go executable you use that use TLS. You can't just drop it in a new library and uh, know that the next time you start the program, it will be linked against the update dynamic library because it won't work that way. Um, that is sort of a problem if you're running Go in a traditional environment where your servers stay up for weeks to months and 
um, you've got a lot of different execute goals on the same machine that you're using. Um, Go is really targeted more towards a rebuild the world, maybe not necessarily a containerized environment, but, but a world in which the host machine or host presented machine, which is probably at least a virtual machine that may well be a container, um, is uh, small and disposable and easily deployable. So that this turns into right, rebuild, re-push, now you're fine. Um, um, in my experience, it hasn't really been a problem, but I have worked at employers where it would have meant that the fixes wouldn't get deployed for a month. Um, so remote imports, you saw it import format, but what if you want something that isn't actually in standard library? Well, either you can download it and then point to its location relative to your Go map. Go map being one of the environment variables that you set up and you set up Go development environment that tells it where to find it and stuff. Or you can say import site slash path. Um, the dependency fetcher is smart enough to know about uh, bizarre Git or carrier or subversion. And it knows that GitHub uses Git. And it can do GitHub, it can do debug, it can do launchpad, it can do IP and DevOps services, and it could do Google code project hosting stuff that doesn't exist. Um, and you can set up private repositories. Um, it does not support CDS. I don't know of a certain large pharmacy benefit management company in St. Louis that I might or might not have used to work for still uses CDS in this the year of our Lord 2016 for its version control system, but they sure as hell did when I left in 2014. And it was pretty horrifying then. Maybe they've gotten better. I don't know. So, the next thing about uh, namespaces and imports, I don't know if any of y'all have seen the international underhanded seed contest, but um, the winner this year largely relied on confusing mendacious imports to put a Trojan horse version of a common library in. Go has a pretty neat way to do this. So let's say I'm writing a program and I need two different TLS implementations. This, by the way, actually happens, and the reason this actually happens is that if you want to talk to Azure or um, uh, Windows Remote Management, um, your TLS uh, implementation needs to support renegotiation, which is a stupid, terrible idea. It doesn't help your security at all, but guess what? That's how Azure and uh, WinRM work. Uh, and the Go standard TLS library does not support renegotiation, but there is an Azure SDK that does have all of necessary pieces. So what you do is you import uh, crypto TLS, which is part of the standard library, and it doesn't have a name on uh, a site name in front of it. And you can import the TLS implementation from Azure, which does have a site name, which you're going to fetch from GitHub to you do your compilation. And just give it a different name by putting a token out front of the where my import comes from. So whenever you call a package function, you saw this with format.py, you always, always refer to it as package.function. So there's no way to do the Python thing where you can import something directly into your namespace or the curl thing. And of course, C imports things directly into the namespace, so that there's only one. Um, so you know, you can have multiple TAM functions, for instance. You can have one imported from your map package, one imported from your salon package. And since you always have to specify which one it came from, when you call it, you're not going to call salon.tam when you meant to call map.tam. Um, and you're not going to get your compiler getting confused and telling you, you're redefining TAM. It, it takes an integer over there, and it takes a time duration over there. Or I guess tangents more likely to take float. Takes a float there and a time duration there. Uh, one map dot ten takes a float. Salon dot ten takes a time duration. Um, and since all of the dependencies are explicit, right? You have to name where it's coming from. You have to call it out by the package name, and they're all done at the file level for the file that calls it. You can never ever get into the situation where something somewhere in the compilation path already imported log4j and while the function you're in wants some feature that was added in 1214 the one that was in the class path earlier is 1212 and 
all of a sudden nothing works except if you don't know it doesn't work until runtime and logs are all wrong and then it's two in the morning and people are screaming at you over the phone and you're trying to debug uh, something that someone else who's moved back to India by now wrote three and a half years ago and if I seem to be showing some signs of post-traumatic stress disorder, maybe I am. Okay, so. <clears throat> So the ghost solution to that is very elegant. Explicit package name spaces. So you will hear a lot of bitching about dependency version. You go. This is one of the things that the hipsters really hate about it. And it's one of the few places they, they kind of have a point. Um, GoDeb is the way a lot of people are doing it, which basically downloads its own copy of your Go dependency libraries into the tree of your project and then builds them, which does mean that you aren't going to be caught out by the upstream suddenly changing versions incompatibly. But it doesn't work very well. Uh, I have heard good things about Glide. The project I'm working on at work is starting to use it, but I haven't used it enough to know that I have an opinion. We tried to use the Go15 vendor experiment, which was an experimental feature added with Go15. That was a disaster to use it. I'm sure it's not going to persist, because among the things it didn't let me do was recursive dependencies, which made it startlingly less than useful. Um, there's a thing called gopackage.in, which uses the tags in your Git repository to let you version your imports back to a particular tag on the repository, but hey, that requires that your imports be in a public repository that you can get to, which is probably going to be a non-starter if you're someplace that doesn't open source its code by default. And B, it's that's a pretty scary inky ad hoc solution. Um, nevertheless, this is manageable, right? If somebody is screaming that Go is completely unsuitable for use in the production environment because of this, they're totally concerned trolling you and blows not really that bad. And they hate Go for some other reason, probably that it is not, it doesn't require that you wear big black red glasses and uh, and a $50 t-shirt. So, things you're going to miss in Go compared to other languages. There is no uh, read-execute um, something plus the loop. Right, so in Python, right, you type Python, boom, you've got a little shell, you can put the Python in, just run stuff interactively, which is a really handy way of prototyping the thing you want before you step into it. Um, as you saw, there is this Go Playground, which lets you do, you know, read eval print. But uh, the reason that the something like this is so useful is that <clears throat> processing is cheap these days. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you go to the playground and you can do that, you know, right, I just added definition of A and I add a little line to print that out. So that's basically like having a record loop, except running it over to a lane network. And you can set this up on a web server you own. It's not that hard, but it's not like just having a window there with Python interpreter running and typing into it. But compilation is totally fast. I mean, you saw there wasn't a, uh, there wasn't a large time between so I mean here's how long it takes, right? One, two. So a little over a second to recompile and execute. Um, so yeah, that, that's not enough time to get coffee. It's not enough. <laughs> That's a plug fail. Yeah, um, <laughs> by the way, which is one point which is that I do consider a reasonable competitor to go, but I'm used to much it does have a rapid loop, so if you use that. Now that I find myself presenting because I got to quite like the Python is optional arguments. Right? Where well, if I call this function with three arguments, it's gonna be these or the following main arguments, and then the following six, if you pass or not, if you don't, either they have the same defaults or you don't use them at all. The way you do that thematically and go is that you make those arguments 
pointers, and then if you're not using them, you pass a null pointer. Right? This is very familiar. People who use C, but after having used Python, it feels kind of gross. Um, things you might miss, uh, especially if you are C++ or a Java programmer. Go doesn't have generics, um, and a lot of people just completely come unglued over that. Now, it is true that Go Generate, which is basically Go's answer to the preprocessor, would let you build a regular expression-based generic system, which you would then run over Go Generate to generate your actual code files. Bill, you could have a generic system if you wanted. I believe there are a couple of more or less generalized ones out there already that people have done. But rather than trying to re-implement generics in Go, it's probably a better idea to learn how interfaces work in Go and you'll miss generics a lot less. We'll talk about other interfaces in a little while. And there aren't preprocessing networks, which if you're an old school C programmer, you're you might miss your, your preprocessor, particularly if you have a bunch of macros that are you know, very clever. Um, so the thing is, saving the time to do a function call is much less of a big deal now than it was in 1975. Um, you know, it, it's not going to hurt that much to go into a subroutine and do your thing and come back as opposed to some sort of hideous inline uh, expanded macro. Um, again, with Go Generate, you could build something that smells an awful lot like the C preprocessor if you insist, but you probably don't need to. Things you are not going to miss at all. Hey, there's no pointer written to. Um, you can still get at things inside structures. You just have to access them by dot field name or you know put the index inside square brackets if you want to index into a particular numbered thing inside your structure. Um, you, uh, <laughs> I just read the uh, Java factory ah, blog. Yeah, that's like <laughs> well, that, that one was shortened to fit on the screen. It, it actually was. Yeah. What's so funny is that it's not an exaggeration. Now it can free go away, so you aren't having to do explicit memory management, which I find nice because I always get lost somewhere around the third layer of pointers and then crap set faults and I feel bad. Um, and, you know, we already talked about not needing a death guards for different architectures for your uh, imports, whatever, your includes, I guess. Yes, uh, Go looks a lot more like C than it does Java, which means the function names tend to be like fairly short and descriptive and readable rather than <clears throat> factory DB connector, factory abstract factory, implement our factory center, factory generate factory. Which really isn't much of an exaggeration over a lot of things I've seen. Did you use that generator for that one? No, no, no. Because the generator would have put factory and factory next to each other in the name. Java also the suffers from factory, factory. the same the same problem that everything that Oracle has does, which is that since it's not the Oracle database, Oracle really would rather not support it. And maybe they have to because there's a big installed base, but they don't want to. They are doing it poorly, I think, on progress. And Larry Ellison wants you to die in a fire unless you're personally buying it and moving off right there. Um, and of course, you need this everything. So I'm sorry, this is back to the scaling off. Um, I, I couldn't figure out how to make this fit pithily onto a slide, but the thing that I really like the absolute most about Go is this. I've written code in a lot of languages over the years, and in most of them, there's this really annoying period between <coughs> the compiler says it's okay, there are no more syntax errors, it builds, and then I run it, and what it does is absolutely not what I wanted it to do, and it takes quite a few iterations to get it there. Um, because, in part, Go is statically typing, because they have seen dependency management and reasonable namespace and then all the other things I've talked about. Like, by the time it compiles, it's usually pretty close to right. And it takes me a lot less time to get it from compilers happy to I'm happy than in anything else I've used. And right, that mostly is C, Python, Perl, and um, hideous little bash scripts. Uh, but, you know, I've, it also applies to Java, which I'm not that good at. And, uh, Scheme and you know, the other weird little languages I've used. 
So if you're not a programmer yet, well, then the, <laughs> the last 20 minutes has probably been kind of brutal, so I'm sorry. Maybe this slide should have come earlier. Um, but you'd like to learn, Go maybe isn't the best first language. It, it's not bad. Um, I mean, you know, my first, so I'm counting basic as not really a language. My first real language was Scheme, and my second one was C, and Scheme was taught just because it was pedagogically the thing in the early 90s. So, I mean, it's nice, right? I like this, always have. But um, and there are worse places to start learning than Go. Um, I think it'd be a better second language, right? Python's a nice place to get over the initial programming comp, and then Go is a little more rigorous. It lets you get away with a lot less sloppiness. Um, if you're just starting out, like the sloppiness isn't necessarily a bad thing. You're probably not writing big projects with other people. I don't care much about collaboration. Um, but you know, some of the nice things that make Go approachable if you haven't been programming professionally for a decade or more. Um, built in apps are really nice. Um, and that second uh, underlying thing should have been out to me. Um, so the small number of keywords and same syntax should be on the same level as built-in maps, and I'll fix that after this talk. Um, would, so, would, you, would you say that the portability is one of the drivers for Go? Yeah, but it's not a thing that makes it easy to learn, right? You're probably going to be learning on your desktop. I mean, it's a great reason to use it. But what, what I'm saying is, like, the, the it works on my laptop is no longer the situation. Oh, right, yes. That it's not, well, it's your laptop in the data center? Hang on, I'm taking your laptop and putting it in the data center. Let's see you say that again. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, kind of, but that, that is a nice thing. Um, but yeah, the fact that Go is a small language with the not insane syntax um, makes it a nice learner's language, right? Sure, you could learn Perl as your first programming language, you could end up having learned a subset of Perl that you know, no one else needs. You only be able to read for some of Perl programs because, sure, no one uses more than 15% of the language, so they all use a different 15%. <laughs> um, so, Go is basically a paradigm, which I think makes it very good for learning languages, right? It, uh, effectively, it's an outer function that calls these sequence of functions, which make internal call functions, and each function is start at the top, you go through the following steps in order, then you leave. Maybe there's some loops inside, but you now it's it's not the functional programming stuff that you pretty much have to do these days in your JavaScript, where all your functions actually return other functions, and then you have all these anonymous functions that you're and you're doing callbacks and like yes, that's really cool. It's a great way to do concurrent programming, like for web pages, but it's a terrible way to learn stuff because it requires you to keep a whole lot more structure in your head while you're figuring it out than you do with something that starts at the beginning, goes through to the end, and stops. Um, Go does have uh, an object model uh, that lets you do sort of classical C++ smelling object oriented programming. Um, and it's it's quite safely done, and you don't have to use it at all. Um, in fact, one, one of the interesting things about the project I'm working on at work is that as we all kind of gotten more familiar with and more comfortable with Go, a lot of stuff we used to do with function calls, we've now moved into method calls on objects as we've gotten more confident about how understanding our data model, how our, our problem works. Um, and it's turned out to be quite easy to transplant things off the objects. Um, and concurrency is, is never easy, right? I mean, <coughs> the hard part about concurrency is the syntax. It's figuring out what's safe to actually do in parallel and what is what really should and you know, Go does foreshadow to do a concurrent model, but it has some very nice same keywords. A cool model when when you are ready to do a concurrent program. Um, but you know, even without it, you can write clear programs that do the right thing and are you know, easily thematic. Like Go programmers wouldn't sneer at you for having written them, and you can you can learn them when when you need them. Um, other cool things if you're starting out, the fact that it knows how GitHub works, or GitHub or Launchpad or whatever, um, and the fact that it will auto-generate documentation from comments in there 
and link them on godoc.org so that if your stuff is public, someone click, clicks on it and says, I'd like to see documentation for this function. As long as you wrote a comment, boom, it's there on the web for them to find. Um, that, that tends to mean that people who put their Go code up for public consumption think a little bit about how they're constructed and try to make it sort of believable. And that's really nice because it means that in large part, most of the Go stuff you'll find on the internet um, really values being lucid and concise, which is, um, so when I say clever and incomprehensible, if no one can guess the language that I'm thinking of, right? Since I've already mentioned it a bunch of times in this talk. Are you referring to an enterprise programming language? No, no, that would be the public screen. Oh, okay. Yeah, and it yeah. is with an Earl, yes. That's <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and yeah, also Go doesn't look like Java, which is my prime candidate for problems competitive and boring. Although it's been a while since I had to do this for real, but <clears throat> identification dash division period. Right? Uh, <coughs> Cobol's also in that space. Um, so, but those are cool things. But yeah, now on to some other features of language. Yes, it's modern language. Yes, it does Unicode code support. Yes, there's a, character, there's a data type called the moon, which is a lot like a car in C, except that it's not necessarily just one byte wide. It holds a letter. Um, strings are really just byte arrays, but they're interpreted as Unicode. <coughs> For the stuff I've been doing, which granted hasn't had to deal a lot with internationalization, and not really <coughs> dealing with text processing and formatting so much, like it just works, and I don't have to think about it. And I can ignore it, and it's perfectly legal UTF. Yes. Do you know if it is it UTF eight? UTF sixteen. You said by arrays, so I'm assuming that's the case. The, the default encoding is UTF eight. Okay, so it's probably. Well, um, does it look at local to see what? It would probably switch to sixteen on most <laughs> systems. Because um, I I'm UTF sixteen for my internationalization. Yeah, no, I, I don't know. Uh, everything I've been working with. Uh, uses UTF-8 as its default account, but yeah. we can try that out. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it, it mostly it, it mostly just works. Um, arrays and slices are another thing. So the array is the actual data type. An array is both what kind of thing, it, it is all of what kind of thing is held in this array, how many elements are there, what is its maximum capacity, and then the storage to hold those elements. The thing you're actually used, usually working with in there is the slice, which is its elements and an indexing of the elements. Um, the distinction between them can be a little tricky when you're uh, when you're learning language. Um, mostly after a while, it's sort of like C is the most comforting example. You you get used to it and stop having to think about it. Um, it's it generally whenever you see something that looks like an array, you're probably doing slice. Um, they, so they support indexing, and like Python, it's half open. And what I mean by that is that the bottom one is in the is included in the slice, and the top index is outside the slice. So here I've got um, I define L as a string array, or really as a String slice, so A, B, C, D, or four elements. Zero through two is A and B. You leave off the first element, and it assumes zero. That's kind of cool. very much like that one. Two through four, C and D, you leave off the last one, it assumes the last one, leave off both. That's all of them. So, one thing you can do in Python that is really kind of nice to say, well, I want to go, I want to get everything but the last item. So, you throw in negative one as your index. Guess what? <laughs> that don't work in Go. Um, so you have to do these slightly more complicated, the length of L minus one. But you know, in general, it works a lot like Python. There is a yeah. It's more a little bit more typing, but it, the uh, minus index that you use in Python seemed a little magic to me when I first encountered it. Well, that's because they are magic. Yeah. Because <laughs> Python internally has to so say the length. Right, the length. It's just another way of putting the limit. Well, it's just the sugar for that last line is all there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, it's sugar that is, well, for a while I was 
flip flopping back and forth between Go and Python on a daily basis. And my Python kept having you know updated commits to the version control system said, all right, it's not Go. And my Go kept having um, commits and said, ah, it's not Python. Um, Does slice include the third increment argument as well? Uh, so you, you can't skip with the slice, it is contiguous. <laughs> if, if you need to skip stuff, you would probably use the built in append function um, to just pick off alternating elements and append them to a different list. And there are two of the keywords are append and copy, so there are easy ways to manipulate these without having to. There's some nice sugar for stepping through these. So the map, just like hash or Python, Dick, the only thing is you do have to allocate space, which is annoying when you first so you can find n with bar it's map a string to a string, then you, know, you want to assign food, the key food to the value bar, and then you want to print it out, which seems pretty straightforward, right? To do that, you get assignment to a tree, mill map, and programming splits. The reason why is that you need to actually tell it the map itself is not nil. The map itself, you need to it needs to allocate some space for it, which you do with the make keyword. And then having done that, you can get the uh, expected results. Um, so make is kind of malic. Make is kind of malic, except you don't actually usually well with, with arrays you can tell it uh, maximum capacity. Um, but if you use a pen dog and extend it past that. It won't actually give you back the same pointer, but it will hand you a pointer to. It will make it look as if that thing grew. It will actually be a different thing that is all the elements of the first thing plus some more space, but from your program's perspective, you don't have to care. Did you have a Okay. Um, yeah, I did that. Are those two pieces of code that are one or the other or, or two? Does M have to be declared first and then make, or does? Oh, okay. So, so here's a little bit of um, Go syntax that I haven't explained. Var M map string string uh, declares the variable, and a declared variable is initialized with the null value. So, if it's an integer, it gets zero. If a map, it actually is nil. Um, but you can also do this very Pascal-like colon equals. To skip saying var and then assigning it, this says that this says initialize m to the result of that, which since it's an explicit make of a string to string map, uh, sets up here. So this these two would be equivalent if the first one worked, but it doesn't because the map is now. Um, you can equally well here. Let's let's go do this in the playground. Um, this will be. Easier to see as an example. Alright, so also goes not Python, it doesn't care that I didn't invent these lines. I will still invent these lines to make it slightly easier for you, but that is not a syntax error. Um, okay, so this will work. Um, right? So I would say make m colon equals that, and I run that. It shows me the so percent v by the way is the formatting code for the default way this thing is printed, which is kind of nice because it means that you don't have to worry much about what it is. You just throw out the percent v and get usually a pretty same textual representation. Um, like if it's a byte array, it's sort of gross because it's just a whole bunch of integers, but. Um, it, it, it is nice and handy when you don't quite know what the right format is in fact to work the thing is in. Um, however, go back to this. So if we just make this m equals, we get m's undefined. I don't know what to do. But we can say we can just declare it the var m string to string. And that works. So the colon equals is just a shorthand for combining the declare it 
and infer the type from the left hand side. Um, and by the way, here is how we can uh, show the entry null map. So I'll comment that out. Um, both C and C style comments are permitted. You either do slash star and then follow it up with star slash or just two slash. Um, and since we didn't actually allocate the uh, storage for it, you get the panic that you're assigning to a month. Back over here. Um, some more stuff about maps. Uh, this is a long slide. I'm not actually going to go through all this, but your key can be an awful lot of things. Not seemly, your key is almost certainly going to be a string or a small structure or maybe an integer, but if it's an integer, maybe you should have used an array, but maybe it's a sparse map, whatever. Um, you can do all kinds of crazy ass things for your keys there. Um, and yeah, go, go there if you want to see what the comparison operators are. All, all it's got to be able to do is say, is this key the same as that key? Um, keys do not have to be orderable types because maps are not an order type. So <coughs> you do not have to have an order. So the structure's looking awful lot like C, right? Yeah, type. So here we're defining an employee. It's got a capital letter, so that it's exported structure. So um, things outside whatever package we're declaring this in could refer to an employee. Each of the fields here is capitalized. So once you have an employee object, you can say employee dot first name. You can also have lowercase uh, struct members, in which case those are only visible within that package, which is occasionally useful. Um, but in general, it's more useful to do public private distinction at the structure level. Um, and fields just access with dots. So, right, you find an employee. So, var the employee allocates a new empty structure. In this case, since these are strings, each first name, last name, and title will be the empty string, and salary will be. Put 64 representation of 0 0.0. And then you just set a title, and that's a string, so there's the assignment. And now your employee is all the empty except the title is yes, no, class. Um, one way you can get inheritance in Go, which is sort of interesting, is the embedded structure. So, name is, uh, we decided we want name to be a little more complicated. It's not our first name, last name, middle name, and something. So, um, Yeah. Adam just important, not the board. Um, but she gives a title. Well, we're getting that. So the employee now, you drop the first name and last name because you just had name. Notice that you don't have name and then name, although you could. It's just name and then salary and title. The cool thing about that, it's an embedded structure. So when you refer to the employee, you say you got first name and it will actually put the first name field within the embedded <coughs> structure. Now, there are some rules about how it finds the right one if you've got multiple embedded structures which should find fields with the same names. Don't worry about it. We can read all the important details. Do you limit those accordingly to make sure you yeah, put it in the right place? Basically, way. once you start having lots of embedded structures with the same fields, Give it a whole half to it so that you you know which one you're talking about because sometimes the one you think you found in one compiler that you can not see. So you can also refer to it as employee that name that first name. Yes, it, it, it is internally represented that way, but syntactic, as syntactic sugar, if it's unambiguous, you can pretend that the first name is way. So there's built-in unit testing, which. Is kind of nice, um, especially if you're that generation of these that testing is uh, important. Um, so it it's, feels a little like the way Perl does. Um, so you, if you're testing whatever dot go, should create whatever underscore test dot go. You should live in the same group. Usually, you want this in the same package as whatever, but not always. The one good reason you might not is that if you're trying to test just the exported functions and therefore you don't want any of the end ones to be visible to you. Um, if you've been sort of sloppy about designing the class in the first place, then you may end up relying on things that you didn't make public but thought you had, and that's good to 
Um, then you name the functions test and then sum out the numeric spread and that does not start with a lowercase letter. That will get run by the time and then, uh, well, but that will get run when you run go test, which is one of the words you can give to the go compiler, installer, package manager things. There's only one word that's go, right? Go get downloads, tendencies, go run, compiles, and then runs, go build, just builds, and go install builds, and puts it into your go path, and so on. Um, documentation available at goodlane.org, not going to go through it exhaustively. Anyway, you also have benchmark and example functions, which are handy. The example functions are useful for documentation, which you might figure. Benchmark is nice if you actually want to do it repeated time tests or function to figure out is this way faster or is that way faster. Um, Go also does some things that are pretty weird if you're coming from C. They may be less weird if you're coming from other languages, but uh, I'm sort of assuming C as a standard model. Go through each of these in a bit of detail, um, but you can return multiple values from a function. Go routines and channels, so I'm going to talk a little bit about those concurrency, not being great detail because it's only an hour talk or so. By the way, I'm going to do it on that. You have 40 minutes left if you want to continue talking. Oh, we've got 40 minutes of slides. Oh, okay. Um, I think you do. How long have I been talking for? I would say 45 to 50 minutes already. All right. You don't have enough slides. Yeah. Correct answer. You've been talking for twenty nine steps. Yes, yes, I have. So go reaching some channels. We'll talk a little bit about the concurrency model. Interfaces in the object model is not like C, but it's pretty cool. Defer is just a gorgeous little bit of syntactic sugar that we'll see that, that I love. It's one of the best things I've ever and the error handling exception model, which if you come from the Java world, or even probably the Python world, you're going to hate this. And if you come from the C world, you're like, well, yeah, of course, it doesn't work. So multiple return values, you usually see in the context of a function that returns a value and an error. Um, so typically, you do it like this. Um, so if something went wrong, which I did not define function prototype, uh, it should return a string. And um, so if you're in a function that returns a string and an error, um, if something went wrong with it, you return the empty string and an error, that's not something went wrong, very helpful. And if nothing did go wrong, you return the string you want to return and nil. Um, what that lets you do then is create functions that should give back a value without having to find some otherwise unused value to overload say this work. Um, you know, for instance, for C system calls, it's not unusual to return minus one as your error value and like an actual value that is not negative for the thing you wanted. This gets around that and this also is a nice way to avoid having to do something gross like set a global error no variable. Um, you don't have to use it just for uh, error returns. I mean, you can define something in terms of head or in a pointer to a map of strings to floats and an error if you want. Um, this is kind of handy if you're doing something that uh, you want to return partition coordinates in free space. You just return x, y, and z. Although you might want to go with the standard C idiom there of just returning a structure or even a pointer to a structure that the x y is kind of up kind of to you, uh, but it's, it's often nice. It is very nice to have a separate error return function. It is occasionally useful to be able to return multiple action lines. So go, go routines are the way Go does concurrency. Um, go <laughs> routine, of course, is a really late fun on Go routine. Um, and it works like coroutines used to way back in the day, and then it's technically user level threading. So it's based on the same variables are visible to all the coroutines, and they're 
basically round robin scheduled inside the runtime. Um, this link here uh, is a really cool um, interactive presentation of what the of where the program counter is within uh, the current code program. Um, and don't worry, I will I will post a, a link to this talk so you can play with it later and see see the go to model. Um, so to start a go routine, and here's why this both feels like part language and so we can just ignore until you need to use it. Go functioning, or alternatively, we can say go func with the prints to say execute it now and then define function. JavaScript world that's going to be a very um, um, All right, so if all you want to do is go off and execute, do its thing, and you don't really care about what it returns, you're done, right? You ran the Go routine, and your main thread exits, your Go routines are burgered and then cleaned up. Or, you know, more typically, you fire them off, and then your main thread would sit in some sort of, probably not holy loop, but a select loop, and just sit there forever until you received an interrupt. Um, if you want to synchronize returns from the routines, uh, they, there is a sync uh, module in the standard library sync package. The uh, wait group is pretty useful. You can just say wait until these threads exit. It's, it's a lot like using the system called wait in the Unix environment. Um, we'll talk about channels though, which are another pretty nifty synchronization mechanism. Um, so the way channels work, uh, channel is more or less like an iterator. Um, you make a channel that has a particular kind of value in it. Um, so hints, or in this case, you have strings, and they can hold up to three. And then the arrow operator um, is the read and write uh, the channel thing. And you, you read from a channel by saying the variable is the channel operator in the name of the channel, or alternatively, you give it the name of the channel and the channel operator that you want to stuff into. And then typically you read them out from the thing that create the thing that created the go routines and they select you. And if you've done socket programming, it looks a lot like that. You're not actually selecting on a socket or a file handle, but it's very much like that. Like you block at the top and select loop until one of the things shows up. Then it looks at the thing that showed up and you take action based on it. So in this case, yeah, we're reading um, into our variable m, and if the read came from C1, then we do the thing that's appropriate to channel 1, and then came from C2, we have the thing that was appropriate to channel 2. Um, so that's a very handy way to do sort of background worker grids for main process where you only do something when one of your workers has news to report to you. Um, pretty good uh, talk on the go lag in the tank 2012. But We'll explain this in a lot more detail. Um, so now on the interfaces and the object file. So how do you do polymorphism in a statically typed language that doesn't have generics? Right? How do you get things that behave as if they're subclasses of a class without having an actual inheritance mechanism? Um, and the answer turns out the interfaces, which are Kind of like Java interfaces, but are both lighter weight and sort of more consistent. Um, I'm not sure that's quite the right term for it, but you'll see. So a type will have particular methods on it. Might have none, but um, yeah, for instance, the reader writer supports read and write. That's what you might expect. The interface that that type uh, implements which may or may not be explicitly named, is just a collection of methods. So anything that supports all the methods in a named collection, the, that collection is called an interface. Anything that provides all those methods for the appropriate signatures implements that interface, and therefore can be used by anything that wants, that needs to be of that interface. So um, when you're using types, you'll, most, you'll usually have uh, either array or structures. This slide doesn't seem to have any relevance to the previous one. I'm giving that, trust me here. So you've got user list, which you know, might be just a list of strings. 
some reason you couldn't just call it a list of strings, except that you want to be more explicit about what this is for in the context of the problem. Or employee, we saw this already, it's just got some fields, right? Um, so when you're actually doing object orientation again, you uh, attach methods to type. And those look just like function definitions, except the first thing after func is in parentheses, and it's variable. <coughs> the variable name is the thing that would always be called this in Java or JavaScript. It is the current instance of the employee type that I am working with, and then change type is, for example, the, the name of the method. So in this case, we're defining a change title method on the employee struct, on the employee type, which is internally represented by a structure. Um, you pass it the title you want to change to, because the variable title, and it's type string, and it will return a type string. The return value is the old type. So the idea here is you call employee.change title, new title, it kicks back what the old title was before you. <coughs> Slightly artificial example, but we've probably seen their faces kind of like this before. Um, something that I haven't really talked about yet, but since you want this to actually modify employee, um, the function prototype needs to be a pointer so that it can change it. This, this is a lot like C, where if you actually want to modify the thing, rather than passing the thing in and getting back from return value, you, you pass in a pointer to the thing and it updates the storage that, the thing that holds the thing. So the, the implementation here is pretty simple. Um, you take the old title out and save it, stuff the new title into the title field and structure, turn the old title into the So this is where we tie the two previous slides back together. All an interface is is a set of type methods that an object has to provide. We're going to look at stringer. What stringer is is that if an object provides a method with the name capital string that takes no argument, and returns a string, then that object, whatever it is, whatever that type is, is a string. And a good way to look at it is that format printout um, will print just, if you use percent %v, or the give me the default way you print this object. If you don't supply a string method, it basically lists each field at the value of that field, which now is arguably pretty useful. Actually, by default, they'll just do this, the fields. But if you give it a string method, it'll do whatever you tell it to do the string method. So we're going to look at what employee looks like, both with and without. So here we're going to import formats. So we need to print something. And we find a new employee. And this is how you can find a literal way to go. E colon equals, so it knows it's going to import the type of the thing after it. It's employee in the open brackets, and you just fill out the various fields. So and the Schultz, the director of something, makes ninety-one thousand five hundred thirty-two dollars twenty cents a year. And then we say format that line and employee percent B, the default representation, and new line. And what you get is employee is curly bracket, and then all the fields in order, as you can see, just kind of lined up. Which, all right, you can see what's in that object, but it's not very pretty. And you can see that maybe if what you've actually wanted to do was use the same program. Dumping out for salary, which, okay, sure, it's part of the object, might not be quite what you wanted in the program. So if we attach a string method to the employee uh, type, and we say the string that we're going to return is last name and a comma, <coughs> first name and space, the bracket with type with some brackets, and we once again run the format that line employee percent date, get should it's a comma in that director or something, which is probably a lot more of what we wanted from that, that type. Um, other common interfaces you're going to see a lot of, reader and writer, require a read and write method, both, um, both uh, take no arguments and return, I think, just an error. Um, and a whole lot of things in the real world are either readers, writers, or reader, writers. And as long as you set up whatever functions it's in is going to accept that interface, then it doesn't matter whether you pass in a file handle or an HTTP socket or whatever, as long as you're only using the read-write methods on the thing that it is passed in, and um, that's correctly implemented, your function works whether it's doing you know, text to a screen or 
uh, traffic to a network socket or whatever. Um, and that that's the whole trick why you get volume on this. So now switching to something a little bit lighter, uh, and at least to me less confusing, defer is just wonderful. So one of the things that is always a theme in at least programs I write is you've got a fairly long complicated function with a bunch of steps, a bunch of places things can go wrong, and if something goes wrong, you have to bail out of that function early. You also have to remember what you've already done and unwind it in that function before you exit, or you end up leaking file handles, leaking memory, you know, whatever. And then that never gets found out in testing because you're never running a program for that long. Then two months later, the thing's been running for three weeks, and all of a sudden it's consumed 18 gigs of memory. And someone calls you at two in the morning because it's crashed to them. Defer fixes that, which is really nice for people who tend to be a little sloppy about them. Um, all you, so we need a defer function. You're telling the compiler, hey, when you generate code, when we ex exit this function, there's going to be a stack of things you do when you exit. It doesn't matter whether it's a regular exit or exit by a panic. We'll talk about panic in a minute. So run the further function. And you set them up as a LIFO stack. So the last one you defer inside a given function is the first one executed. And the arguments are evaluated at the time of deferment, which um, gives you a sort of closure like effect. I'm only mentioning it here because it is not necessarily what you would expect, and it can bite you if you aren't aware of that. The thing that is going to get run is defer a call with the arguments that are in effect at the moment that the first statement is encountered, not the moment that the first statement is executed. Which kind of makes sense because you're already outside the stack frame of that function by the time the defer is called. So, of course, the uh, arguments are what it was when you found the defer, but it's not, it's easy to forget that. So, here is a real world example. Um, bucket, comma, error is the result of getting a database <coughs> the account base is most of the So, this, this is saying, give me a database. If I did not get an error, or I, sorry, if I did get an error, then I'm going to do something here, probably lock a message and just return with an error because I can't do anything without my database and the rest of the function. But if I have it, and I've got this database bucket, and if I exit the function and I forget to close the database handle, then I've leaked the database handle, which is a pretty big structure. And yeah, I mean, I can probably do that a couple dozen times a minute for. 20 or 30 days before it becomes a problem, but eventually it's going to become a problem. And traditionally, I would have to remember that every time I bailed out a function later, um, I'd have to clean it up. Not so with defer, because all I do here is that as soon as I know I have a valid bucket, I say defer bucket dot close. Now, when I leave the function, it's going to clean up my database connection. Then I can do you know, hundreds of lines of stuff and not worry about it. And when I exit, it's cleaned up. Um, this has saved me dozens and dozens of <coughs> minutes, anyway, um, in, in my head. So I talked about panics. Um, Go has an error and exception mechanism, kind of, that is like throwing an exception in Java or Python, but they don't encourage you to use it much. I mean, right, you know, in Python, if you're a Python programmer, in general, rather than returning an error value, you're expected to just create an exception and let that bubble up, and then the error handler will catch it. And in Java, everyone's familiar with multi hundred line stack traces with almost no useful information in them. Um, go figures that in general, an error is an error. It's not exceptional. Like sometimes things just don't work. And because you've got a nice mechanism for returning multiple values, You'll just return the error, and the thing, can, the thing that called you will check the error value and take appropriate action. But sometimes shit's really broke, and the right thing to do is panic, which basically almost always means we're dead. Print a stack trace and keel over. Um, you know, file I/O is often a good example, but I'm trying to write something, and that write failed. We better stop because if we keep going, things are only going to get worse. Um, so, uh, 
before I get to exceptions, the error is just the interface type. It implements one function, which is capital E error, that returns a string. That means that it's really easy to write your own error class. And for example, if you look at the HTTP library, um, that error has a whole lot more structure. But it also includes errors of string, so you can treat it as just an error, a, a value of type error in the rest of your program. Or if you know that it is in fact the HTTP error, you can look at the additional structure and do something. So here's a very typical use of error. Um, you've got function star row, returns an error. Um, if it gets one for uh, strings that it likes, it'll return nil, and otherwise, it will return an error. Um, format error f, by the way, is basically just uh, S print f, but it always puts its, uh, it, rather than putting the result of the function into a string, it puts it into an error and passes the error function. So, you will see all over error or something comma error is some function. And then if error is not equal to nil, do a thing, that is your error. Exceptions, therefore, are when something is not really handleable. Um, you know, if an error just catches part of your normal program flow, do what I, do what you gotta do, which may include os.exit some error code. Um, but usually doesn't. Usually you just want to log it. Um, to log an exception, you call panic. Now panic sounds pretty panic inducing, and that's because you shouldn't be using this very widely. Um, when you hit a panic and you're in a function, stop the function execution right there. Um, exit the function, so then, as usual, execute all your preferred functions. So if you panic at something that's just open to database connection, that's fine as long as you remember to defer the close you're still going to clean up. Now, probably isn't going to matter because you're probably not going to catch the panic. So the process is probably going to exit. So, yeah, but you don't have to die with the panic. We'll show you how to catch this. So return to whoever called F and actually if you encounter the panic right there. So that's how you propagate it back up to the chain. You can recover from the panic. It's called recover. You can only do it inside a deferred function. Um, and what that does is just take and a panic like error has a string inside it that describes it. it uh, if you recover, you turn the panic back from this thing cascading up through your call stack, uh, destroy the program as it goes to a function that returns a string. So you effectively turn a panic into a regular error. Um, if panic gets all the way to the top of the go routine, the program exits and you get statements on the console. Um, so a good a good example of recovered panics are inside JSON because the way that the way JSON is unmarshaler turns receive JSON into Go objects is that it tries to stuff the fields that it got out of JSON into the main fields in the object. And if that fails horribly because that field doesn't exist, that creates a panic. However, the library then intercepts it and says, I couldn't unmarshal that and returns an error rather than just crashing the program. Because you probably, you don't necessarily want that input data to make the program explode. And in general, that's how you use Recover, right? Um, if you're inside a library and you do something that causes panic, you probably don't want to let that panic propagate outside the library because then you're being very rude to your problem. The corollary of that, of course, is that you probably shouldn't uh, use Recover unless you are writing a library for other people. So, so a few more random things about the language. Um, functions are first class objects. You can assign them to variables. Uh, you can create anonymous functions with you know, bunk, print, print, curly brackets, and stuff. Um, the nice thing about that is that you can dispatch tables easily. So if you're writing something that is, I don't know, display manager, and you want to have functions that get called, when you click things or drag things or put an object on the screen, you just pass function. You, you can pass functions or you can see the function pointers. There's nothing stopping you from doing the pointers here into your dispatch table. So hey, when I receive a click of it, I go run that callback. Um, and it, it works very nicely. Um, 
you can do type introspection to peer into objects and get out things that are not in the exported fields. Um, I've only so far needed this in real live code once, and that was when I was working with a method that expected um, an encryption key. I knew because of the problem domain that I was always working with RSA uh, key pairs, but the library didn't. The library knew only that I was working with a generic, a generic key pair. Type. But I needed to extract the uh, modulus and exponent from the RSA key for what I was doing. So I had to go through reflection to get the unexported fields and extract them. Um, if you find yourself doing it a lot, and you're not doing some kind of decoding, parsing, non marshaling thing, you probably approach the problem in the wrong way. You should take a step back, take a deep breath, and decide if this is really the way to do it. Um, even the reflect, well, the reflect stuff has a lot of interface in common with the package named unsafe. And it's really nice that the package named unsafe is unsafe because that's where all the stuff that lets you step around the type system lives. Um, it is possible to do, but I think it's very nice that the language designers have helpfully marked it as a there are landmines here part of the uh, part of the system. So you can put that on a, uh, a pre-commit hook? What, to see if there are any if, if anyone has unsafe? I think you could. So uh, there is support for the major and some of the minor editors. Um, in <laughs> Emacs 24, uh, the Go support actually comes packaged with it and is quite nice. You can install it for Emacs 23 and below. Um, I've been using Atom a fair bit just because it's more like what everyone else at work is using and it doesn't suck. If you're a VI user, at least Ben has nice um, Go support. I don't know about the other featureful VI clones. Um, and then everything else has a Go mode too. Um, usually you have to install it. It's a third party plugin or add on. <coughs> but there, there are a bunch of them. Um, and it, the things you really want, I mean, syntax highlighting is very nice to have. And something that runs Go format on a save is important. Um, also, I think something that lets you change tab display width to something more simple than 8, like 2 is important. But I'll get to that because although Go itself doesn't care about white space, um, there is a right way to do it um, stylistically, which involves tabs. And I would rather not have to do that. So Go did a beautiful little jujitsu move here on the whole language war thing. Well, see, uh, do we want the uh, KNR style function declarations or ANSI C? How wide should tabs be? Is it okay to use snuggle braces? Right? Just like that. But there's one way to do it. But here's the thing. With a uh, 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 verb to go called go format, it takes go and analyzes the sentence because it's sharing the same backend as the compiler, so it knows what that means, and it rewrites it into what it considers the proper textual style, which is great, because that means that everybody's Go code looks just the same if it's gone through Go format. You can configure your editor to display it in a way that's pretty cute, which for me is two space tabs and do a word rack to eight columns. And um, all the editors support just run Go format on save which also serves the function of doing syntax check and telling you that, hey, syntax for this isn't right because the formatter will mark at some point while it's constructing the syntax tree. Um, and then by the time you upload it somewhere that it's turned into public documentation, it's formatted the same as all the other Go code on the web. It's really elegant. So GoDoc um, is another piece that just comes with it. If before each uh, exported function, you have with no vertical white space in the comment that starts with function does. Then the first time anyone uh, ever looks for the documentation by import that, so you know, slash compilator, slash cryo, uh, slash cloudy uh, to the end stuff, um, it goes out. So a go doc will look and see if it's already got the cache. If it doesn't, it will download your code, generate the documentation, and then present the page to the user and catch it. So 
you get if you are using one of the three uh, built-in globally visible repositories for your code, which if you're doing open source work, like the odds are pretty good you're using GitHub or Bitbucket, um, then boom, you've already put the documentation out there for people to find, which is glorious. Go also has a cute logo, which is very, very important. There's the Go Gopher on the side by the main page. Aww. One more thing, when you start using Go and you want to know how to do something, and you're probably going to end up with Stack Overflow, but you'd rather just go to Google instead first and ask the question. When you're asking questions about Go the language, call it Go Lang. Do not just call it Go. So you call it Go, it turns out that's a very common English verb, and you'll be really sad at the things Google finds. Whereas Go Lang usually gives you the right answer. So this is the time filling slide. Either we can wrap it up right now, or I can say, hey, we've got however long we have. Does anyone want to write something slightly larger than Hello World? And then we go to the playground and write that thing. Um, you've, got, you've got 13 minutes. Go for it. Yeah, that's a problem. Uh, I don't know. Does anyone want to see a piece of code that will take 13 minutes or less to write? Any suggestions? Anyone? OK. Fair enough. So you want to get the slides for this talk? It's on GitHub, right there. Um, go, it mostly doesn't suck that Git. If you invite the ignore in the GitHub, it's pretty obvious which one is this talk. There's also a slightly further sanitized version of the talk, by the way, that I gave several months ago about um, containerization. Um, and then a couple of random projects that are very little relevant statement for me, but you're welcome to go around. So, um, if anyone's got any questions, I'll do my best to answer. Go back? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, here we go. Yeah, if you just get to the eighth one part, you'll, you'll see it. Um, and actually, I guess I will take some of my 13 minutes to address a uh, the question that appeared before the talk that I haven't really directly addressed, which is, what's Go good at? And if it's good at C, then why wouldn't I just use it? If it's good at the same things that C is good at, then why wouldn't I just use C? Um, it's a good question. I do think that Go is basically targeted at the same space, though less sort of hard, real time. Like, you're not going to do kernel development in Go because it's garbage collected language, and you don't get any real time guarantees. Um, I find myself using it where I would use C, um, but I don't have to deal with all the memory management BS myself, and I don't have to go digging around the world for libraries that do the things I need, particularly um, uh, XML and JSON interchange formats, because like, yeah. I don't see that very unlikely. The, the built-in HTTP, and I mean, it's super useful. Yeah, it, it's so it's like basically if you want to write microservices. You're, you've got an entire language that wants to be static as much as it can, and it's got HTTP, JSON, and XML built baked in, and it's and, like, and what else do you need? And, and though HTTP libraries are about as good as Python, as Python requests, if you, if you know the request library, which is really nice compared to other languages. But I also find myself using Go in situations where I would have used Perl or Python. If I'm still doing like go for a big long text document doing regular expression matches, I'm still going to use Perl because it's more convenient for that than using the right excellent But like a lot of the stuff I would have used Python for two years ago, I use Go for now. Um, I find that so actually this is probably one of the few places where this statement is going to make sense to most of the audience. How will it remember back in the days before Perl and Python when pretty much you had shell and you had C, and there was a certain point where like, it just outgrew what's comfortable to do in shell, so I'm going to go reach for the C compiler and do it in C. Go makes that feel like a perfectly reasonable thing to do once again, even though I've now done Python and Perl, but the stuff that's a little bit over the top of what's easy to do in shell, well, I may as well just implement and go. It'll be quicker. Um, so. Even though it is not a dynamic language, I find myself using it in a lot of places 
I would have used a scripting language, particularly Python. Um, that may mean that I learned Python after Perl and I never grew to you know, internalize it like Perl, but like, there's very little that I would now willingly write in Python rather than Go. Um, yeah, it, it's great for writing microservices. It's terrific for writing stuff that's going to be deployed and you containerized for these very stripped down environments because you don't have any dependency management, right? If you're writing something in C, you have to make sure that the libraries go along with it unless you statically link it, but it's getting part of the statically linked stuff these days. Um, if you write something in Python, you have to deal with creating the eggs and specifying the dependencies, and making sure that the dependencies are all there and go. Like, Boom, there's an executable. All right, now put it on the following 38 machines with Ansible, and you know it's going to run, which oh, yeah. is delightful. Um, and it, it fits perfect into the rocket paradigm of, you know, you're basically tossing out your manifest, and you've got clean microenvironment, and there's your go. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. What's it good for? Um, I... I guess I use it as it's like C, but I make fewer stupid mistakes and I have to stare at six sentences a lot less. Um, <laughs> you're better at C than I am, but that might be a concern. Um, does anyone have any? Uh, I, I think that the, the hand holding, <laughs> making sure that you don't make some of those mistakes early on, make it better than C. Yeah, well, I mean, the, the whole dependency track. Is way better, and on large projects, that ends up being it makes the overall project a lot easier to understand. And then you don't have tons and tons of dangling dependencies that no one yeah. understands. And, and it, it does so. So far, I've only really used it in small team environments, but it seems to work really nicely for a team of six people. Um, I, I don't know how it would work for 40 people, but if you have 40 people, you really need to be doing that with multiple teams anyway. Um, nice, clean little language. Um, and yeah, it, it's pretty opinionated, right? And though there's usually one right way to do things, and a couple ways that might work. But yeah, you know, it's no pearl where there are 14 ways and they're all equally wretched, except for that one, which is even worse. Um, <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, like the Python and the, the Go and not Ruby at all, but. Uh, it's almost user supportable by somebody that doesn't really swallow all the language. Yeah, well, and one of the great things about GoDoc is that the documentation also has links back to the implementation. So when you're like in, when you're reading the documentation and you aren't quite sure what they mean, like you just click on the function name, boom, a, a tab on GitHub opens up and there's the source code. And then you could look and see what it's doing because yeah, it's, it's, it, it, it's basically bringing doxygen into yeah. language. Okay, I mean, for instance, um, yeah. I've been using the rabbit find. I can't get to GitHub from here, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay, well, I was going to show you a library that I've been using a lot and how cool it is that I can just click from the documentation and see what the actual library is. Mm -hmm. I, I can get there from here. Okay. Yeah. It, it, it's not really terribly important. Oh, okay. yeah. I work here. Yeah. But, so, <laughs> I, I, I see the management of this my SSL connection. What? Oh, the management of this my SSL connection. That that whole that whole decrypt policy. Yeah. You have a question? No. Oh. Does anyone have a question? Going once. Um, yes. when, we, when you did the maps, how do you iterate over the keys? Oh, <laughs> right. Let me show you this, because that's what I was talking about before that is just kind of glorious. Um, so let's do this. Can you do a, a zoom up for this web page? So. You might have to drag it over a little bit. Yeah. 
There we go. So here I have an exciting map with two keys. You say one one of the one of the ways the for loop is for k comma v range m. And this range operator, by the way, works exactly the same for lists, except k will be the list index rather than key. So for key, common value, so there's a the use of multiple assignment. And then when I do this, that well, I think you have, you, I think you have two brackets somewhere. No, the BAS no, doesn't have a brand. And now I'm just going to continue forward. The format print line doesn't have a closed, uh, closed print. Right. There you go. Let's try that. Oh, <gasps> shame. For shame. Oh, well, <laughs> you even that, said. They declared not use because I didn't do that. So, so you can use it. You, you see what I mean? Then by the time it compiles, it, oh, and that shouldn't be print line. So by the time it compiles, it almost did what I wanted. There. So that, that's how you iterate over a map for key comma value, uh, colon equals range, and then the range operator ranges over its argument, and that argument can either be a map or an array. For instance, The colon equals just looks like a little bunny to me. Yeah, yeah it does. <laughs> Let's see. Let's oh. <laughs> and of course, it might have been nice to put that right thing there. So it also works for us. And really, that should be index rather than keep. You get the idea. Um, the other nice four thing is that just four by itself is an infinite loop. And, oh, there, there are no whiles, there's just four. You can also do it in C style where you do four, I equal zero, I plus plus, etc. Um, I, I find myself using a lot of four over a range. Uh, any other questions? When you said that the, the key and the K and V range over A, do you have to say both of them? What if yeah. I just wonder if you can just range the key and then go look up the value when you want it? Or you can just, so another thing that I didn't want to talk about, you can use underscore to mean, I don't actually care about this. I know you're returning it to me. I'm just going to discard it. So in this case, for instance, I'll get rid of the K and just loop over values. And in this case, I can actually leave off the comma second thing entirely. And Percent D or percent S? Oh, thank you. You're right. Um, no, that was percent D. Yeah, percent D. Yeah, that's yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Over the range, over the, over well, the range A, but it's key, but it's key of an array, so it's the index, which is an Right. I, I'm not using N anymore, which is. You're not using N. Yeah, I missed that. But. So in this case, yeah, the key is an integer. So although the for loop has both, you can use either one or the other one. And that, that by the way, is exactly the equivalent to that. Right, we should say, yeah, I know I'm getting the value, but I'm going to for, for, for what it's worth, what if you put percent S there, what would you get? Uh, uh, the int. The int. Yeah, I, I get the, hey, it's not really, I got a string format, but really it's an integer, so I'm um, I don't know what you do. I don't know yeah. how to format it. Yeah. What about percent D there? Percent D? That should work nicely. Yeah. Now, could you put back in 
percent uh, s for where you get the double dash there. If I do that, it will tell me if the value is percent s because I don't have a. Well, now oh, it's missing. Comma, yeah. you, comma, you, you have a formatting placeholder there and not put in it. We now put comma after the okay. k. Comma, can you put comma a bracket k? No, no, not there. Next, next, down the inside. Oh, there, yeah, okay. right there. Yeah, that'll work. Can you do that? Yeah, that's that's thinking more old school procedurally where you have to look up the K rather than just ranging this, over it. This is how you do it. Let's see if that works perfectly fine. Um, there, there's also just the sugar of being able to do it in the food But now you can wait, but now that you've got in uh, you should be able to change that range A to range M and it should still run with percent V and percent S. Yes. Everything change shouldn't have to change did oh, well think. yes, the yeah, M there that the one. M, yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> See? It told me that I that all also another thing that I didn't mention. Not not just imports, variables you declare that don't need to use are there on the side variables. Which um, is annoying for a little while and then you're like Wow, it's cool. It turns out I no longer need it. So when, it when it ranges over the hash, it's indeterminate to what order range is going to come back. Correct. Of course. Although I mean, it, appears be, is, it, it appears to be determined for multiple runs of the same thing. But yeah, the hash, the hash is unordered and no guarantees are made. And as yeah, you can I'm see, trying to remember what the not trying to what they what when you do a for each on a hash in Perl. If you do it, if maybe you do a sort. Right. Yeah. Typically, if you care, you do for sort key hash split. Um, and if you don't do the sort, you get it in some order that is the internal hashing key, probably. Did you apply a sorted function to the range? Yes. Um, I'll apply it. Yeah, it's, it's not quite Pythonic, and it's not quite Perl. I can't do sort there, but there is a go by sort where um, there, there is a sort function you have to include the sort module and that uh, sorts a slice of, in this case, the strings. Note here that the lack of generics does hurt us a little bit that there. The way they've chosen to do it is that uh, you have different floats for different, um, you have different function names for different kinds of things. So strings is things that look an example here. Oh, that's not what I want to do. I think it is. Anyway, so so the short answer is yes, though I would have to read documentation to get it right, but at least you would call something from the sort package on the list that is the range of uh, keys in there, and then it right over from that. Um, and you could do that all in line, although I think it would get less reading. But you, you would end up calling sort on capital sort, and then one of the arguments to sort would be the String sorter function that they provide with them, which might just be less than or equal to. I don't remember if strings are inherently ordered or not in Go. They probably are, since they are in C. And probably is just doing a byte comparison of the string, but I would swear to that that would be not. Well, um, I'd like to thank you for doing your talk here. You 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 filled your time and then some. Okay. Well, thank you. As is our uh, usual procedure to uh, have a little uh, uh, memento for the speaker, uh, seeing as if he's ghost on outside, uh, most of you probably all get to be the Linux mascot, but uh, the uh, 
Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from from uh, the Penguin and Puffin Coast uh, collection at the zoos. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and uh, we, 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 we normally don't have something besides the speaker award, but uh, we kind of neglect that one of our uh, uh, multiple speakers for a number of times. Because uh, actually, Andrew usually comes up with more penguin things uh, than uh, uh, he, uh, he has. So. I, I actually use them as pillows because they're they're just much better. We haven't rewarded uh, Andrew for a number of talks. He's given over a number of talks, and also we know this kind of fits Andrew's style. And, uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, thought I, I thought I'd seen him wearing that. Well. That's the one you need tonight. No, the one I wore tonight no, is this one. Oh, oh, that, that is the one I have seen you wearing. That's the nightcap. Okay. That's that's for wearing to bed at night, I guess. Try that one. A model new one. Model new one. Model new one. Yeah. It looks like it's a kid size. I don't know if I can hit fit my. Uh, Get your melon head in there. <laughs> Stretch. But I can put this on top of another penguin. 